Tonight, Canada joins an international mission to protect a vital shipping route. These attacks are reckless, dangerous, and they violate international law. Cargo ships under siege in the Red Sea. Who's behind the attacks? How it's connected to the Israel-Hamas war and why the impact is global. A Kia employee goes public and blows the whistle on a secret sales tactic. I've been in the industry long enough to possibly understand, and I don't anymore. Why vehicles are being held back even while customers wait. And scientists watch as the world's largest iceberg is on the move for the first time in decades. And then suddenly you're seeing this expansive white wall on the horizon. This is The National with Asha Tomlinson. Thanks for joining us. Adrian is away. We begin tonight with growing tensions tied to the Israel-Hamas war, playing out in one of the world's most important trade routes. Cargo ships in the Red Sea are being targeted by Houthi rebels based in Yemen. They say in solidarity with Palestinians. The Red Sea is a critical shipping route that leads to the Suez Canal. Today, two more vessels in those waters were hit by drones. Many shipping companies are now opting for a safer but longer route that takes them around Africa. An international coalition is now scrambling to provide security and Canada is playing a part. Kayla Hounsel takes us through that and how it's already impacting trade. Attacks like this by Yemen's Houthi militia on ships in the Red Sea have been escalating. A response, it says, to Israel's assault on the Gaza Strip. Energy giant BP is now the latest to pause sending ships through the Red Sea, causing both oil and European natural gas prices to rise. If creating a disruption in global trade flows was the Houthis' intended um, effect, then yes, we are going to see that level of disruption. Four of the world's five largest container shipping companies are now pausing transit through the Red Sea. Many are diverting their ships around the southern part of Africa, causing delays. They're also charging a war risk surcharge. That then is passed on to the consumer in terms of increased pricing. This expert says those companies move everything from household goods to electronics to telecom equipment between Europe and Asia. But most goods coming into Canada, he says, are not shipped through the Suez Canal, so the fastest impact on Canadians may be the price at the pumps. BP's announcement is raising fears more companies may also stop sending their ships through the canal. So much of global trade goes through the Suez Canal. It's about 12 percent of the total global trade volume. That's a huge amount. Over the weekend, U.S. and other military forces say they shot down more than a dozen drones in the area. These attacks are reckless, dangerous, and they violate international law. And I would remind you that this is not just a U.S. issue. Uh, this, is, this is an international problem, and it deserves an international uh, response. That international response involves a coalition of a number of countries, including Canada. But a Houthi spokesperson told Al Jazeera the group is ready to confront any coalition. All right, Kayla, what more can you tell us about Canada's involvement in this new international coalition? Well, the Pentagon says it will carry out joint patrols in the southern Red Sea and in the nearby Gulf of Aden. We don't have a lot of details on Canada's involvement, but a government source tells CBC News Canada will be deploying a handful of personnel to the International Task Force, but no ships. We do expect more details on what those personnel will be doing to follow, Asha. Something to keep an eye out for. Thank you, Kayla. The U.S. Defense Secretary is also pressing Israel to shift how it's conducting its war with Hamas. As Sasha Petrasik shows us, Israel is facing growing pressure abroad and at home as the horrors in Gaza mount. New images emerged of the panic at Gaza's Nasser Hospital after a tank shell slammed into the second floor, hitting the bed of 13-year-old Donia Abu Mohsen. On social media, after losing her leg in an earlier airstrike, she spoke of her dream, becoming a doctor, now killed by that tank shell, according to Gaza's Hamas-run health ministry. The relentless fighting and its civilian death toll concerns Washington, prompting U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's visit. To achieve total victory against Hamas. To convince the Israeli Prime Minister 
to temper his tactics. In many, and about uh, how to reduce uh, harm to civilians uh, in the battle space. Israel's defense minister promised a shift to lower intensity fighting with no clear timeline. We will be able to uh, transition gradually uh, to the next phase and start working uh, on bringing back local population. That means that it can be achieved maybe sooner in the north rather than in the south. Outside, families of hostages taken by Hamas camped out in protest. After three hostages were mistakenly gunned down by Israeli soldiers in Gaza last Friday, they want immediate negotiations. I don't care if uh, we will need to stop the war for this uh, or give uh, the Palestinian prisoners, even all of them. Uh, the, it must be a deal uh, to bring them ho all back home. On the ground, in Gaza's Jabalia refugee camp, nine civilians lie dead in a schoolroom. This man claims Israeli troops shot them before his eyes, all unarmed members of his family. Israel's military says it is investigating the incident, but as its rules of engagement come under scrutiny, it insists it adheres to international law. And it says Hamas is using that against Israel. Hamas is weaponizing international law. Hamas is using our humanity to wage war. Leaving two million civilians caught in the middle. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. An Ottawa youth already charged with terrorism-related offenses is facing new charges tonight for allegedly targeting Jewish people. RCMP alleged the suspect, who can't be named because they're a minor, instructed someone to carry out an attack on Jewish people with an explosive device. The youth appeared in court today and is now facing five charges in total, including two for being in possession or control of explosives. They're expected to be back in court Wednesday. New numbers out tonight show just how few Canadians appear to be up to date on their COVID vaccines. According to national data, less than 15% have one of the latest shots to protect against the current variant that's circulating. And as Lauren Pelly tells us, it's cause for concern among health professionals heading into the holidays. The holidays are top of mind for many Canadians right now, not another COVID vaccine. I am not aware about that. I don't know if I want to take it. If it's not mandatory, I wouldn't. New national data shows uptake has dropped off. Few people in younger age groups have gotten the newest shots. And while coverage rises with age, only a third of adults in their 60s had the latest COVID vaccines, and less than half of those in their 70s or older. If it's been more than six months, and particularly for those high-risk folks, uh, it is really important to get it. It gives you this extra protection. This vaccine clinic is trying to turn the tide, since hundreds of Canadians are still being admitted to hospital every week with COVID. That risk remains far higher among seniors. Several medical experts told us that higher risk groups should treat these updated vaccines as essential, not optional. That means older adults, people who are pregnant, and anyone with serious medical conditions. The virus keeps evolving. Canada's chief medical officer of health says the latest shots are a better match for the virus strains circulating right now and can boost immunity that may have faded. Even protection against severe outcomes wanes over time. Others worry those messages aren't reaching the public, leading many Canadians to assume they don't need another round. We shouldn't think of them as boosters anymore. We should think of them as being like flu shots, where we have to update them whenever there's a new variant of concern. 77-year-old Alex Ciperni got the updated shot on Monday morning. Got to look after us. And this is, we've had every one. And with more holiday gatherings around the corner, doctors say it's not too late for millions of other Canadians to follow suit. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. The CBC News Go Public team is exposing a secret and controversial sales tactic being used at Kia dealerships in Ontario and allegedly right across the country, withholding vehicles from customers who are waiting for them. Erica Johnson explains why. He's worked for Kia for several years, wanted to go public about his concerns, but he's also concerned about keeping his job, so we're not identifying him. He says he couldn't believe a scheme hatched by Kia Canada. 
someone else is reading his words. I've been in the industry long enough to possibly understand, and I don't anymore. The plan, for the rest of the year, keep new Kia vehicles in storage on car compounds that manufacturers use, like this. Only release some, even though many customers have waited well over a year for their vehicles. The strategy was delivered by Kia Canada's Central Region Manager on behalf of top Kia executives in a video call to dozens of dealer reps in Ontario last month and allegedly affects the whole country. An employee recorded the meeting. With the global slowdown, Kia Canada wants to control wholesale and retail performance in 2023 to not show high overachievement. The manager says there's a high risk with overperformance selling too many vehicles that headquarters in Korea will withhold the extra marketing budget Kia Canada wants next year. Well, let's be very, very clear. Like, this is a message that comes from Kia Canada. The chat box fills up with comments by frustrated Kia employees. This shows a complete lack of respect for every dealer in Canada and our customers, writes one person. How to sell the bad news to customers who've put down deposits? They're told to blame logistical issues. Mr. Customer, we just been informed by Kia Canada that there's going to be some shipping delays for the balance of the year. This expert says all car manufacturers use sales schemes, but calls this one unusual. It is normal for automakers to use creative strategies at the very end of a year. Uh, however, usually those strategies are to help increase sales. Uh, not reduce them. And in this case, he says, it's the customer who pays. It's not right to make customers wait even longer when they've already been waiting for so long and dealing with quite a bit of frustration. There are thousands of Kia customers waiting for vehicles right now. What does Kia Canada say about all this? Well, as Kia Canada wouldn't give us an interview or discuss the video, claiming it couldn't comment on what it called internal confidential business matters. We also reached out to Kia Korea headquarters. They had nothing to say. Now, keep in mind that Kia is known in the industry for having some of the longest wait times for vehicles. So even after all of these vehicles on compounds are released, there will still be a backlog for many customers who put down deposits months ago. Really interesting story. Thanks, Erica. And remember, our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, reach out. Go public at cbc.ca. After weeks of earthquakes, warnings, and evacuations, a volcano in southwestern Iceland has finally begun erupting tonight. The fissure grew quickly and is now 3.5 kilometers long. A town of 4,000 is in danger of being consumed by lava. It was evacuated weeks ago. A geothermal plant and the popular Blue Lagoon tourist attraction may also be at risk, but the effects of the eruption are local with little impact to air travel. In northeastern Australia, they're assessing the damage tonight after heavy rain from a tropical cyclone triggered severe flooding. The runway is underwater in place and we're about to get more heavy rain. The flooding shut down airports. Queensland's premier saying some areas are simply cut off. This one is, uh, this level of rainfall is next level. Hit hardest, Queensland's northern tip, which has seen months, in some places even a full year's worth of rain in a single week. Floods engulfed homes and streets and stranded both humans and wildlife. He's looking at you. Oh, he's having a whale of a time. Conservation crews pulled a nearly three meter long crocodile out of a drainage ditch and kayakers rescued this wallaby, frantically searching for land in a flooded field. Oh the rain is expected to ease tomorrow, but swollen rivers and dangerous conditions will last for days after. At least five people in the U.S. have been killed in a massive storm that's been racing up the Atlantic coast. In the U.S., the storm brought torrential rain, high winds and flooding. Vehicles were submerged in New Jersey and people had to be rescued. Hundreds of thousands of people are without power. It's the same storm system that caused heavy damage in South Carolina and Florida over the weekend. And now that same system is bearing down on much of Atlantic Canada. Thousands lost power. Some areas are seeing winds over 100 kilometers an hour and as much as 50 millimeters of rain. 
The White House is calling Donald Trump out for what it calls grotesque rhetoric. This after the frontrunner for the Republican presidential nomination took aim once again at undocumented immigrants. Katie Simpson now with the rhetoric and the response. God bless the USA. Incendiary statements by Donald Trump are becoming more frequent, even routine. In this moment, his critics fear voters are numb to it. It's not okay. It's not okay for an American president to be saying these things. At a rally in New Hampshire, Trump railed against the southern border crisis and people crossing illegally into the U.S. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. They poison. They're coming into our country from Africa, from Asia, all over the world. They're pouring into our country. Nobody's even looking at them. They just come in. The White House called the language grotesque, while Joe Biden's re-election campaign says Trump parroted Adolf Hitler. In Mein Kampf, Hitler's manifesto, blood poisoning is labeled as a threat to racial purity. Donald Trump, for his entire political, public political career, has been making uh, statements that are pretty xenophobic, uh, pretty racist, and meant to you know, scare people into, into coming out and voting. Trump remains the dominant frontrunner in the race to become the Republican presidential nominee. His base of support is so committed, most of his challengers tiptoe around any kind of criticism. I agree with a lot of his policies. But rightly or wrongly, chaos follows him. If polls hold, there is a chance Trump may return to the White House. With concern among critics, he'll surround himself with allies ready to indulge his impulses. I think for Trump, you're 100 percent loyal or you're not. Um, he's, he's demonstrated pretty clearly that if there's somebody who gets a little bit uh, out of line, he'll, he'll throw them to the wolves pretty quickly. Trump is doubling down on his anti-immigration rhetoric. If reelected, he's promising to organize the largest deportation operation in U.S. history. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. A New York jury has found actor Jonathan Majors guilty of assault and harassment after an incident involving his former girlfriend. Jonathan, what do you think of the verdict? How are you feeling? His former partner said she was attacked after reading a text on his phone from another woman. Majors' lawyer argued he was the actual victim after she flew into a rage. He was slated to play the lead in an upcoming Avengers movie. But tonight, Marvel Studios promptly dropped him. After two previous guilty verdicts were overturned, a Quebec woman has now been acquitted of murdering her children in a third trial. Adele Sorella's daughters, Amanda and Sabrina, were found dead in 2009. The Crown argued she had the exclusive opportunity to kill them, but a Quebec Superior Court judge says there are gaps in that theory. Juries convicted Sorella in 2013 and 2019, but both times the verdicts were overturned because of errors by the judge. A monster iceberg three times the size of New York City is on the move in the open waters off the coast of Antarctica. It could potentially block uh, penguin colonies if it, if it got, comes near shore. The threat it could pose and why scientists are tracking it so closely. Next. Those Christmas jingles you can't get out of your head. A lot of these songs end up getting tons and tons of, of listens. Why so many artists are looking to get into the spirit. And later, a little holiday cheer from a feathered friend. Dolly is exceptionally calm, sweet, and really likes attention. The chicken that's lighting up the internet. We're back in two. The number of dead continues to climb in northwestern China after a powerful magnitude 6.2 earthquake rocked a border region at about one minute to midnight. Search and rescue operations went through the night, but state media reports more than 100 people were killed in Gongsu province and at least 11 others in neighboring Qinghai province. The world's largest iceberg is moving in open water after being grounded on the ocean floor since the 1980s. Ben Shingler now on the concerns from scientists and what it can teach us. A mass of solid ice, three times as big as New York City. 
and it's on the move for the first time in decades. This team of scientists saw it up close this month. Sailing straight through this mist, knowing that there's an iceberg only a mile away, but not quite seeing it yet. And then suddenly just seeing this expansive white wall on the horizon. Laura Taylor took water samples near the iceberg to better understand how they affect ocean life. We saw orcas and birds and things like that, which wouldn't normally be that populous in that area of the water. And yeah, they were all kind of gathered around the iceberg, which also made it really interesting. Known as A23A, it broke away from the Antarctic coastline in 1986, but quickly became stuck on the ocean floor. Now it's moving again, north, possibly posing a problem for South Georgia Island, east of South America. It could potentially block uh, penguin colonies if it, if it got, comes near shore um, and uh, disrupts wildlife in that regard. While A23A broke off as a result of its natural life cycle, similar events are expected to become more common as the world warms. We're going to be seeing more and more of these ice shelves breaking away and causing icebergs the size of, of this one and many smaller ones as well. Scientists are studying ice shelves closely because they play a crucial role. They keep the glaciers from flowing out onto the ice, out from the land and onto the ocean. And so that uncorking of the bottle will allow ice to move from the land and into the water, and that will create a sea level rise. Researchers are trying to better understand the physics of how all this happens and what it means for the future as the climate changes. Ben Shingler, CBC News, Montreal. As Israel's military campaign in Gaza continues, life has become even more perilous for those trapped inside. I live with guilt, firstly, actually, for everyone that I've left behind. The video diary of a family on the move and one man's agonizing decision to get out. Plus, a dangerous journey to freedom for a young Afghan refugee. I nearly lost my life twice. His new life in Sweden and the trauma that still haunts him years later. The National breaks down the stories shaping our world next. So kiss me under the mistletoe. Pour out the wine, let's toast and pray for December snow. Well, love it or hate it, it's beginning to sound a lot like Christmas. In fact, you've probably been hearing Christmas music since Halloween, let's face it. New tunes are pumped out year after year. And as Eli Glasner shows us, artists have a good reason to go with the holiday flow. Is it really the holidays if you haven't heard Mariah? Or this seasonal earworm? Rocking around the Christmas tree. It's beginning to look a lot like. These days, there's more competition for Christmas tunes with new merry music from a host of artists. For Lauren Spencer-Smith, Broke Christmas was a way to cut through the commercialization. We're so sad all the time. That's really not what the holidays should be about, whether or not you have money. Um, so I feel like it was a really funny way to just laugh about the fact that everybody else is going to get iPhones. With the music industry prioritizing streaming, the right holiday hit can help an artist punch through thanks to the power of playlists. Holiday playlists, or to listen to holiday playlists. So a lot of these songs end up getting tons and tons of, of listens uh, through that very feature of streaming services. Santa baby. Just ask Cher what was behind the release of her first Christmas album. The record company. <laughs> but for a lot of it, legacy artists, it can be a way to get uh, back out there, get back on the charts. Charts now dominated by seasonal selections. Christmas wasn't even part of Alex Cuba's life growing up. But when he was writing a song... All of a sudden, the word Navidad showed up in my mind. And in a world where musicians are under pressure to constantly create, the ready-made marketing of the holidays helps. It has become more and more important for musicians to find the right time to release music and, and to, because if you could use the marketing that already exists out there to your advantage, then um, you have more chances. Sometimes it's just a song with a simple message. Love cannot be wrapped in paper. And a 
a way to ride the wave of a lucrative listening trend. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Toronto. Now let's break down the news shaping our world. On International Migrants Day, we caught up with a man who fled Afghanistan as a teen. Eight years later, a lot has changed for him and for more recent migrants seeking a better life like he did. But first. The rawness of life inside Gaza from a man who chose to stay and help family. At one point, I had 50 people in this three-bedroom apartment. Now comes the difficult choice to leave. I'm never going to see a lot of people that I love again. Uh, I'm here with... What's that? Lamar Mahmoud. Mohammed Galini's video diaries help us take you inside Gaza, bringing you closer to communities under siege. Here's Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. This little one is just six years old, but by now she knows how this goes. This is the fifth time she's moved out of her home in Gaza. And every time the family moves again, they're able to take less and less. It's Rafa they're headed to now. Who knows for how long? I guess our whole family has had the privilege of having this shelter. I mean, obviously, they've, they've definitely suffered, but they've also been shielded from the worst effects of having to, like, shelter in the streets or shelter in a school. When the fragile and fleeting ceasefire ended in Gaza, those who'd found relative safety in places like Khan Yunus realized they had to go again further south. According to the UN, 85% of Gaza's 2 million plus residents are out of their homes. So they're packing the car. I guess mattresses on top of the car have become a very familiar scene. We at one point had 50 people in this three bedroom apartment. Day by day over the last five or six days, a family here, a family there left. Some went to the middle area, some went to Rafah. This is Mohammed Galini an air quality scientist who lives in Manchester, England, but was visiting family in Gaza in October when the war started. Everyone here is preparing for the worst. Uh, I am worried uh, for what's to come. Despite an opportunity to leave early on in the war, he stayed. I don't even know what happened here. And he sent us weeks worth of videos to show the reality of life on the ground. It's the 13th of November. I think it's the 36th day of the war now. He was determined he could make a difference staying and helping. That was then. Everything is different now. Mohammed, do you think you're okay? God. Um, <laughs> no, no, I don't think I'm okay. He's now in Cairo, Egypt, left days ago. So while he's physically safe, his mind is cruel. I live, I live with guilt, firstly, actually, for everyone that I've left behind, I guess, to their fate. And I fear that I'm never going to see my home again. Uh, and I'm never going to see a lot of people that I love again. OK, so Hedy has been practicing jumping from the chair and landing on his feet. Hello, Hedy. So I guess you'd reached a point where you thought you actually, and I'm guessing here, can't be useful to other people, but you might end up being a burden on them. Uh, yeah, either, I guess, by taking resources, but also by potentially being one of the casualty, casualties of Israel's attack. There was, he said, a moment when it was clear he had to go. It wasn't long after this eerie scene. A Han Yunus market typically bustling, even in the worst of war, suddenly all but silent. We had, I guess, rumors that our neighborhood was to be evacuated. The whole street was dead. It was really eerie. I was fielding phone calls from everywhere saying, what are you still doing there? So yeah, it's December 9th. For the whole period of this war, leaving has been such a dilemma. It's an impossible decision because basically staying ultimately gives is, is you're afraid of death and destruction and injury but also leaving um isn't that much safer you're going into the unknown of not finding shelter not having enough water not having enough food and so possibly dying 
I spent the morning listening to the airstrikes around me and some of them sounded very close. They shook the house just like an earthquake. Before leaving, he kept chronicling the world around him, including the frequent messaging from the skies. The warnings from Israel delivered by drone. I'm on my way back uh, from trying to get leaflets. The wind was blowing quite hard, so uh, a kid actually on my way back had gathered quite a few and gave me, uh, gave me one. This video from CNN Arabic seems to show the leaflets he's talking about being delivered. They appear to show a quote from the Quran that references Noah's Ark and a warning about an incoming flood. Muhammad and many others took it as a warning to them. So I think that message relates to Israel's plan to pump seawater into the tunnels. I think it's a message to the people uh, rather than to Hamas. I think it's a message to Gaza. It's just saying, we're, gonna, we're going to beat Hamas. You should join us. Speaking of drones, just listen to the background of almost all his videos. The drones don't seem to stop. Always watching, always greeting. What is it like to hear the drone droning on 24-7, it seems? Awful, awful. Constantly there, often really loud, like it can go from being sounding, I guess, distant, sounding like it's in the next street away. It's also like the sense of being watched all the time. We're going for a little walk. Uh, these guys... While he was in Gaza, he found that beyond getting water and food for friends and family, entertaining the kids, keeping them calm was critical. The ceasefire meant a bit of a moment to breathe. But just when they were relaxing, the war came thundering back. Uh, she doesn't really like fully grasp what's going on. And I'm kind of like in some ways like glad of it that the children are not like fully aware. Uh, obviously, I mean, they're, they're, they're not stupid, they are aware. But this one, I'm impressed about like how, how resilient and fearless she is. But I also hate the fact that she has to be. He stayed with the kids as long as he could, and then it was time to go. A decision made quickly. Tough to leave the little ones behind. The Rafa crossing, not as busy, because fewer and fewer people have the option to leave. The road to Cairo, lined with aid trucks still desperately waiting to get into Gaza. And Cairo itself? Comfortable, but disorienting for a man whose heart and mind is still in Gaza. It was... Great not to hear the drone, not to hear any bombing. Everyone's going to think I'm mad, but I struggle to take a shower. I don't want to leave Gaza behind, and I feel like washing off the dust in the remnants of Gaza is like leaving it behind. So I, I did eventually take a shower. Uh, Mohammed, thank you very much. Shukran, Afwa. And we reached out to the Israel Defense Forces to ask about the meaning of those pamphlets, which Mohammed Galini interpreted as a possible warning to Gazans. We have not heard back, but we do have word about Galini's family in Gaza. So far, they appear to be safe. If you want to see Mohammed Galini's previous video diaries, you can find them on our YouTube channel. Just search for CBC The National. Coming up, almost a decade ago, he put everything on the line for the dream of a new life far from home. I want to, in some way, give back a little bit to the society. The story of a teen's journey to freedom, his trauma, and his gratitude. That's next on The Breakdown. the harrowing journey of a teen migrant who fled Afghanistan for a better life. I take risk, I take a big risk. We were sure that we will die. Now, eight years later, we meet him in Sweden and ask about his struggle to assimilate. It's mentally very, very hard. But this man is no quitter. 
The UN has declared December 18th International Migrants Day. So here's Jean-Francois Belanger to break down one migrant's voyage to a new home. We first crossed paths eight years ago on the coast of Turkey. It was in August 2015, in the middle of the largest exodus of the 21st century in Europe. Mohamed Reza Rezai was just a teenager back then, barely out of high school. Together with dozens of other Afghan migrants, he was about to try and cross the Aegean Sea aboard a rubber dinghy, hoping to reach Greece. Of course it's not safe, you know. I take risk, I take a big risk. <coughs> but I think it's necessary for my life. Mohamed Reza had never left his country before. He was seeing and touching the sea for the very first time. Yeah, it, and it tastes salty. This sea. He was understandably apprehensive. Uh, so that boat that sank, I'm really, I'm right, right now I'm really afraid, you know, even my foot is shaking. The young man filmed his perilous journey aboard this inflatable boat, afraid he might not make it. Overcrowded, the raft quickly started filling up with water and the engine stopped running. The dinghy drifted for eight hours before finally being rescued. At that time we were hopeless. We said that we all will die, you know. We were sure that we will die. This dramatic journey made the headlines and left its mark. Mohamed Reza is now 25 years old. We caught up with him in Gothenburg in Sweden, where he now lives. I study now uh, at the university here. So here, he was able to pursue his lifelong dream, to go to university. To be honest, I really like it here. But upon arriving, he got off to a rocky start. First few years, it was very tough. I couldn't speak Swedish. I, I was just a child. It was, it was very hard. Intensive language lessons, however, and years of immersion changed everything. I speak Swedish better than my native language. I feel more Swede than I feel Afghan, to be honest. Over the past eight years, Mohamed Reza had not looked back at those dramatic pictures. Yeah, it's, uh, it's strange to uh, see that. Yeah, I was so naive and I, yeah, I thought it would be, it would be fun. But yeah, it's, uh, it brings back a lot of memories, to be honest. The whole ordeal left him deeply traumatized. I nearly lost my life twice on the road. Many, many nights here in Sweden, especially the first few years, I cried myself to sleep, that I was in the dark. I didn't know if I'm going to stay or not. And that takes take a toll on you. Like, uh, it's mentally very, very hard. With time, however, things got better. He spent some time in therapy, met good people along the way, and finally got his papers, allowing him to stay. I was lucky that I got to meet the right people at the right time who helped me through stuff. And here we have uh, my little sister and my, my brother. Mm -hmm. She's not that little anymore. She's like 20 years old now. Thanks to the resident's permit, he was able to go back to his country and visit his family he had not seen for more than seven years. Catching up with his beloved little sister was long overdue. Yeah, I miss her very much, very much. It was strange because she's almost as tall as me. So I was like, where is my little sister? Nowadays, Mohamed Reza's life isn't any different from that of millions of young Swedes, except that he doesn't take anything for granted and considers himself very lucky to be able to study. I love Sweden. I love how liberal it is, how free. I'm not paying a tuition to go to the university here, which is a dream for me, because I, I wouldn't be able to afford to go to university. Before coming to Sweden, Mohamed Reza wanted to become an engineer. 
but he changed his mind along the way and is now studying to become a social worker. I want to work with people, like uh, have this human uh, interaction. I want to help people too. So it was a natural uh, choice for me to be a social worker. I've been in that situation that I needed help and people helped me. After all those years, all those opportunities, the young Afghan feels like he owes a lot to his adoptive country. I want to do good. I want to help those who I can help. I want to, in some way, give back a little bit to the society. When he looks back at the clueless teenager he was eight years ago, Mohammed Reza feels a lot of empathy for his younger self. I was a teenager, I was naive and learning by mistakes. Given those humble beginnings, the harrowing journey to get to Sweden and the even longer road traveled since feel like a huge accomplishment. I am proud of how I've done in the past couple of years. I want to have a future, I, have, I want to have opportunities and options, which I have now. I think I made the right decision. I think that I found uh, what I was looking for back then. Jean-Francois, the story you just told us is one that ends well, but that's not always the case, right? No, Mohammed himself told us how lucky he feels compared to many of the people he traveled with. A lot of them had problems adapting, learning the language, finding a job, and many simply did not feel welcome. And just trying to normalize their situation, legally speaking, was a struggle for most. We all remember, you know, the millions of migrants from Syria, from Iraq, from Afghanistan, who really swept through Europe in 2015. Uh, they were met with open arms pretty much everywhere, but those days seem to be gone. Asha, that's clearly a thing of the past. European countries have made it much harder to get in, so the migration routes have changed. Most people now try to get to Europe by traveling across the Mediterranean Sea, which is, of course, much more dangerous. They go through Libya, which is already very tough, and then they try to cross to Malta or Sicily in Italy aboard overcrowded rubber boats in really appalling conditions. As a result, many capsize and drown. 61 died this weekend, according to the UN, which brings the death toll this year above 2,200. That is a dismal number. Jean-François Belanger, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, a uniquely feathered Christmas display is lighting up the holidays. So our oldest daughter is like, oh, I could decorate Dolly. Meet Dolly the Christmas Chicken, next in our moment. Allow me to introduce you to Dolly the Christmas Chicken. She's what's known as a silky, a breed of chicken known for their fluffy feathers, and her owners decided to decorate her Christmas style just in time for the holidays. A video of the bird's glowing plumage has gone viral, spreading joy to millions of viewers. So tonight, Dolly the Christmas Chicken is our moment. We have 13 silkies. They are a bantam breed of chicken, which means they're smaller than typical chickens. We absolutely love them. They are wonderful pets. Our oldest daughter had these tiny wire LED lights, and she was like, oh, I could decorate Dolly. So we tried it out, and it was really pretty. Dolly is exceptionally calm and um, sweet and really likes attention. She seems very comfortable on camera. It's just a tiny wire strand of lights and it's like a watch battery that's inside. So it's just sitting underneath. It does sink into her plumage. Well, I can assure everyone that it was definitely safe. I think it was above 4.5 million views as of yesterday. And to be able to bring something joyful to um, people's lives, so that makes us really glad. 
expanding with pride. Millions of views and now merch, apparently. Sarah says there's a huge demand for Dolly merchandise, like stickers and shirts. So looks like Dolly might be hatching a new influencer business. We wish her the best of luck. For all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Asha Tomlinson. Take care.